that he operates with a sense of entitlement in the way that he conducts himself with people. He lacks accountability for his activities, can be haughty and dismissive with people, so he ticks lots of boxes that support the evidence of his narcissism. And he's manipulative. So, H.G. Tudor, is Russell Brand a narcissist? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what makes you think that? A variety of factors. Uh, you may be aware that I did a detailed analysis, 16 or so parts, about him. What causes me to reach that conclusion is that he operates with a sense of entitlement in the way that he conducts himself with people. He has an absence of emotional empathy, which is evidenced in the way that, for instance, he has treated people in the past, that often when he's talking, he doesn't listen and to what's being said to him. He's very much set to send rather than receive. He lacks accountability for his activities. Uh, he's somebody that doesn't really define his relationships properly in the conventional sense. He's somebody who has freely admitted to telling lies. He's an individual that doesn't provide any meaningful um, emotional support to people. He doesn't address issues in his relationship in an appropriate form, the various relationships that he's had. You only have to watch the footage that took place between him and his father when they boxed together to see the fractious nature of that relationship and a lot of where uh, Russell Brand's behaviour comes from. There's huge amounts of grandiosity with him. Um, He's an intelligent man, that, that much is clear, but he thinks he's far cleverer. He has this flamboyant way of behaving, he has this very flowery language that he uses, he enjoys all of these various monologues that he embarks upon, and he's manipulative. And he uh, can be haughty and dismissive and arrogant with people, so he ticks lots of boxes that support the evidence of his narcissism. He portrays... Um, himself as this now as this guru that's got all, all of the answers and lots of people have bought into that there was a did you see that interview he did years ago with peter hitchens no i didn't uh, that was it just it just suddenly came to mind now because peter hitchens the, the brother of, of the late christopher hitchens uh was trying to have a sensible debate with him i think it was about drugs it might have been something else um and every time Peter Hitchens made a point, and I don't agree with everything Peter Hitchens says, by the way, no. but every time he made a point, Russell Brand came back with just like silliness, just yeah. like, just a, oh, well, well, you're a bit of a homophobe then, aren't you? And it was like, he wasn't talking about being gay, he was talking about drugs. It was like completely unrelated. Sorry, yes. It, I mean, that demonstrates the deflection. So Hitchens has asked him a question which is subconsciously threatening his need for control and therefore he responds in this fl flippant way that you've just described with something that's essentially a non sequitur. And you see, he plays the gallery all of the time. Whenever he appears on, on a, a chat show, um, he will... Uh, to an extent address the interviewer but a lot of it is expansive in terms of wanting the audience to get on side because he needs to control them i picked up on one of the points that when he was having a discussion with his father in the uh, rebrand episode at one point he basically says to his father about how um, do you know do you know why i'm doing this uh, and then he talks about how he hates himself and then he looks as an aside to the camera as if to say are you getting all of this is uh, are you with me whereas for somebody who was not a narcissist, if that was such a serious emotional disclosure, you wouldn't be caring about what the audience or what the camera would do, be doing. You'd be focused on what your father, how he was reacting to it. So it's got this almost sort of pantomime element about the way that he behaves, which is part of the showmanship which he regularly engages in. And he's entirely superficial. Um, he comes across as uh, well-read, but I should imagine that any serious individual that would debate him, as you've just alluded to with uh, Peter Hitchens, would soon pierce the superficiality that he exhibits and that you'd find there isn't a lot of substance that's there. He's very good at throwing out the uh, flowery descriptions and being very wordy. It sort of reminds me a little bit of somebody, I think a little bit unfairly once said about Stephen Fry, that he's a stupid person's image of what an intelligent person is. I, I think Russell Brand actually fits quite well with that, that it's not to insult people who are interested in him, but if you want true depth in terms of people who are fantastic orators and debaters, there are far superior versions to him. And he's very good at tapping into a particular 
um, phrases, etc. But a lot of it's essentially a word salad. Mm-hmm. That that sort of stupid man's intelligent person. I, I agree with you that it's unfairly used on Stephen Fry. It's something that can so easily be thrown at somebody who's good at breaking down complex subjects for for lay people, which is a, mm-hmm. which is a, a skill that I really appreciate when someone's able to do that. And Stephen Fry, I mean, I'm, I've read some of his novels recently, and and I, I think the guy's super super smart. Um, but but not you know, there's different kinds of intelligence. He's clearly intelligent, but he, he likes to show it, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I entirely I entirely agree with you if if your audience is unable to understand you then the failing lies with you i think it was the law lord lord denning who was a very bright man he would invariably give his judgments as best he could in layman's terms to enable people to understand and he basically took the view that if you can't understand what i'm telling you that's not your problem it's my problem so the ability yeah. to communicate and i agree with you stephen fry is very good at taking those concepts and putting them in a way that people who are perhaps less academically inclined are more able to understand the the key is to be able to communicate it's what i do with a lot of the work that i do about narcissism and psychopathy because i'm not a psychologist mm. i put it in i put it in ways that people will be able to understand um, I don't drop it down to the the, the lowest common denominator. That, that isn't necessary. Yeah. But I put it in a way that people can grasp with the use of analogies and utilization of language that they're familiar with. And that's what's a- appropriate because that enables you to reach more people. Russell Brand sort of does the opposite to Stephen Fry in, in using deliberately obtuse language and then difficult to understand language. Uh, but I wonder if there is a difference as well in there childhoods obviously Stephen Fry, well Stephen Fry I think did have a bit of a tumultuous childhood I'm not entirely I don't remember exactly how it went but he's clearly quite posh and Russell Brand is quite working class and they might have different yeah. things to prove well w- with Brand we know that he as you p- explained came from a working class background where mother was the primary carer and, and dad disappeared for long periods of time he drifted in and out of uh, Russell's life, which clearly his narcissism comes from his father, because you can see that in the way that his father behaves. It's it's very interesting. At one point during that episode where they're talking to one another, he he makes mention of the fact that he says to Russell, "You were very emotional when I didn't when when there were occasions that I didn't turn up to pick you up when me and your mother were estranged," and he says it in as a way as if to say. I'm completely at a loss to understand why you would be so emotional about your dad not turning up for you. The man simply did not have a clue. He didn't even have any cognitive empathy. So it's clear that the narcissism was passed on from him and that he created that lack of control environment that Russell Brand experienced because he wasn't around. And there were other factors. Brand says that he was abused by, I think, a tutor. He talked about him. Uh, sexually abusing him which again it adds to a lack of control environment so he had the two constituent parts that forged his narcissism mm. it for anyone who hasn't seen that russell brand talking to his dad thing it is one of the most bizarre uh, snippets of tv i've ever seen you can find it somewhere on youtube just type russell brand talking to his dad or fighting his dad um and that entire series i was speaking to, i didn't watch much more of it but i was speaking to someone who used to watch that he's like going out and doing some of the maddest things like pissing everywhere and taking drugs and things the kinds of things you wouldn't imagine you could do on tv anymore it really is set in its time well it's a sign of its times um but so yeah i i just i couldn't believe what was going on there where he's like confronting his dad and then he goes back to his mum and he goes oh you know i'm gonna have a fight with dad and you are constantly i guess what i want to say is I understand your conclusion, but my I had been having a go at Russell Brand, and then I watched that, and I started to feel really sorry for him. And mm-hmm. I thought, oh, God, he's like a bit of a puppy. And I suppose, are you saying, yeah, but he's making me feel that? Yes. If you look at the life of many narcissists and you find out what made them be what they are, you will find that they will have suffered a lack of control environment. And... That lack of control environment can come from lots of different factors, but the most common ones are physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect. And therefore, to somebody who has emotional empathy, they get the backstory of the narcissist, where it's genuine, because sometimes it can be made up by the narcissist. But let's say another family member tells you about little Johnny's history as a child. 
invariably it will involve that child having been abused and somebody with emotional empathy will feel sorry for the narcissist. Now, in those circumstances, your emotional empathy is causing that to happen in relation to a tale you're being told about the narcissist. But when Russell Brand behaves as he does on the screen, he's being governed by his narcissism, which will cause him to tell you about what has happened to him. And the sole reason that's being disclosed is to manipulate the viewer into feeling sorry for him, thus according him control and drawing fuel by way of a response. So his narcissism basically picks up in his backstory and it, it sort of whispers into his ear, make sure you tell him, Russell, about the fact that your dad wasn't around and how that upset you and made you feel, you know, uh, abandoned and so forth. And commonly, of course, narcissists will use that, although it's accurate because that's what formed them, they will use that as a means of escaping accountability by basically saying, I can't help the way that I am. I'm a child of divorce. I can't help the way that I behave. I had a rough childhood. And whilst that's accurate in their formation, their narcissism is allowing them to say that as a means of getting rid of accountability and using what has happened to them to manipulate whoever they're talking to in that particular moment. Now, I had a difficult childhood, but I don't use that in the terms of wanting pity from people. I don't want people's sympathy. I don't want pity. People can, un I tell people by way of enabling them to understand. Invariably, they express sympathy for what has happened to me. And I'm not interested in that, but they do that because they've got emotional empathy and they've been conditioned that when you hear about something horrible happening to a child, society's standard response is to say, oh, I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we should say as well, remind those who don't know, because we're 10 minutes in, that you are, by your own admission, a narcissistic psychopath. I am both by my own admission and diagnosis, yes. Ah, right, yes. So, Russell Brand, you, we talk about, okay, his childhood, and it was difficult and weird, and his dad took him for his first sexual experiences. It was all really bizarre. Yeah. Um, is the suggestion then that one is made a narcissist? Well, you're, you're, you're created, as I mentioned earlier on. You have the genetic predisposition that comes from a relative. So those are, the, those are the cake ingredients, if you will. And then you need to be popped into the oven at a particular temperature and for a period of time to be baked into the narcissist. And that's your lack of control environment. So let's say, for example, uh, Mr. Brand uh, Senior, he passes on his genetic predisposition to young Russell. But mum is able to bring him up without any difficulties whatsoever, even though dad departs. He's not really exposed to that lack of control environment. Thus, he has the cake ingredients, but it's not made into a cake. Thus, he doesn't become a narcissist. Or a child might find themselves subjected to a lack of control environment. So, for instance, they don't have the genetic predisposition, but they witness their, both their parents being killed in a road traffic accident which is a horrendous lack of control environment in, in a very short space of time, they don't become a narcissist because they do not have the genetic predisposition. So you need both. With Russell Brand, his father gave him the genetic predisposition and then his formative years, which were basically where his dad was not around and was coming and going, so he had no certainty, created a lack of control environment by all accounts. He will have witnessed to a degree some of the fallout between his mother and father even though, of course, at one point, his father says to him, well, I left, so you didn't have to witness all of that, to which Russell Brand reacts quite um, vociferously by saying, you didn't do it for me, you did it for you. Don't try and make it out that you did it for me. So he clearly has a dim view of his father, but nevertheless still needs to control his father. So in some instances, he will try and control his father by making him feel guilty, which is a completely wasted exercise because his father doesn't. And in other instances, he does it to say, hey, it's me and you, Dad, mates together. We've had a box. Do you feel all right after that? That was quite good, wasn't it? Let's go for a pint together and, you know, sing knees up Mother Brown or whatever. It was a bit bizarre, wasn't it? Um, the other thing that stood out, I think, that actually scared me, it gave me a bit of a chill, was some. there were corroborating statements from some of his accusers. And, of course, mm. we do have to separate his sort of bad behaviour from accusations of sexual assault uh, from, from women, um, where they said he got a glazed look in his eyes. He wasn't yes. Russell anymore, and just yeah. his dark eyes. Is that sort of more psychopathic then? or what? What is going on with that? 
Well, when that happens, that's actually uh, quite common with narcissists because um, that was described by his accusers in relation to when he was having sex with them. And the fact is that when a narcissist has sex with you, the narcissist is simply masturbating with your body. There is no intimacy there. There is no connection. You're connected to the narcissist. So you may be feeling that you love the narcissist, that, you know, this is a, uh, that you're connecting in this way, however you want to describe it, and that you make the eye contact and there's talking and so on and so forth. For the narcissist, all that matters when they're having sex with you is four things. Are you under control? Are you providing fuel? Is there a character trait that might be acquired? And is there a residual benefit? Now, most of the time when a narcissist has sex with you, three of those things apply. Sex is used to control you. Sex is used to get fuel out of you. So your oohs and your ahs and your ooh, give it to me, baby, provide fuel to the narcissist. And the narcissist experiences pleasure because they have nerve endings too. And therefore, and the narcissist has an orgasm. And that's a residual benefit of having sex. The narcissist doesn't need to feel any meaningful connection with you because they're incapable of doing so. And therefore, what happens is, in effect, the narcissist is on autopilot. So the glazed look is simply, he's not in the moment in the way that you are because his narcissism is operating like a background app, controlling him to control you, uh, drawing fuel from you. And you don't matter because he might as well be masturbating and he's doing so with your body. You are simply an appliance that's there to be used by the narcissist. You're not a human being. So that glazed look that comes over is because he's not really present in the way that you are. He's actually focused on alternative needs compared to what you're getting out of it. And yet he's so present when he's not in that moment. You know, the way he's, he's, he's on, he's electric, he's doing all the charm. So, so why is that? Why is it that he's utilising the charm or why is it he's not present in other circumstances? Well, I guess I'm thinking like if it's so, it's obviously important to him, even if he is a narcissist, that people around him like him, even if it's just so he can use them. So Mm. why is he turning that off and just getting this glazed look when he's engaging in, in sex or, you know, I guess it's not even sex, is it? Because the narcissism operates on the basis of it wants to get the maximum return for the minimum of effort. So think of it like a car, okay? So when he's interacting with people on a television program, he's driving through the streets. And so he needs to make gear changes. He needs to indicate. He's looking in the mirror, etc. So he needs to be present to guide it through there. When he's having sex, it's essentially he has achieved what he wants to achieve. So he can go into autopilot. So the narcissism basically says, we can control you by causing you to thrust your hips etc but we don't need you to be bantering away like you ordinarily would with a television audience so the narcissism drops him down into an autopilot setting so it's conserving effort and energy because that's what narcissism is is, uh, fundamentally about it's causing the narcissist to behave in a way so that they can get the prime aims with a minimum of effort and therefore you can get some narcissists when they're having sex they'll be very attentive They'll look you in the eye. They will say the words. You know, they might be quite soft and delicate in the way that they touch you because there the narcissism is deeming that you need to do that to control that person. But in Brand's case, evidently the person he's having sex with has demonstrated that they're under control, that they essentially fade out of the picture because the narcissism thinks, yep, this is going well, they're under control, we're getting the fuel, switch him into sort of economy mode now and thus he's no longer present. I see. Well, are there suggestions then, because he, he obviously doesn't care, he can see that these women are in distress. One of them's trying to run away and he's got her against a wall. Mm. Uh, another is a 16-year-old who's obviously going to have a, her life affected by how he seems to be grooming her um, and move, keeping her, his, her mum away from her. Uh, is there, are there suggestions this is also somebody who might be a psychopath? He just doesn't care about these people. Well, narcissists don't care about people. I don't see that there's uh, psychopathy at work with him because he has exhibited anxiety. He's spoken about the anxiety and that one of the prerequisites for such a finding of Mm. antisocial personality disorder is conduct disorder uh, when he was younger. And that didn't seem to be present with him. So one would rule that out. I think he has a sadistic streak because he derives Mm. 
enjoyment from seeing the dis- the um, pain and misfortune of other individuals, and that provides him with a fuel spike. So he gets off on seeing the misery of other individuals. But all narcissists have no emotional empathy, and therefore the fact that he could uh, do what he's accused of in relation to raping that lady against the, the wall in the house and the treatment of a 16-year-old, in effect, the fact that that young lady was 16 becomes irrelevant she is an appliance that is there to be utilized now some narcissists will have due regard to the age of an individual because it could affect their facade so the outside world their control of the outside world would be affected by the suggestion that you're a nonce or a kiddler or something like that he doesn't operate with a facade what you see is what you get so his narcissism glosses over the issue of her age she is meat that is there to be devoured by him for the purpose of the prime aims interesting did you did you hear or or watch or anything about how he was with his his dog when he was younger yes well i spoke about that in the analysis about Topsy the dog, where he would lure her to the top of the stairs, and then once she got there, would say, oh, Topsy, you're not meant to be up here, and kick her back down. And he said it was almost as if she lived with an evil twin, one at the bottom, that would, and he would then go down and give her a cuddle. And so, again, that sadistic behaviour um, in relation to the way that he was treating the dog. Now, I know that mistreatment of animals is something that's often associated with antisocial personality disorder and there may well be a trait in relation to that but i don't see that he gets over the line to be found that he actually has the condition Um, again a narcissist would behave that way because of the absence of emotional empathy uh, the fact that he can lord it over something less powerful than himself and also that black and white behavior i treat you well at the bottom and i treat you badly at the top you've done um a lot on love bombing you, you, uh, videos about love bombing and narcissism and I've talked about love bombing in, in, in reference to cults and cult dynamics is that part of Russell Brand's game is that do you see love bombing in him when you know he makes you feel like the only person in the room if he, if he wants you in part of his cult yes absolutely uh, Russell Brand will love bomb in two ways the traditional way if you will with an intimate partner you're amazing I must have you gosh your hair smells so fragrant nobody smiled at me like that before yada 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 in order to draw them in and he does it with the people where he seduces them into his world as presenting himself as this messiah-like character and therefore he love bombs the audience by treating them well by saying to them basically you and I are entering into a pact together just me and you, Roger, in Ealing, or Faye in Whitley Bay. Each individual has that one connection with Russell Brand, as you point out. It's as if you're the only person that's there. And how he does this is basically saying, I'm going to let you into a secret. I know what the World Economic Forum's about. I know about this new world order. You are an awakening wonder. And thus, by making that person feel special, not in an intimate way, but he's still love bombing them because he's treating them to this suggestion that they are special and distinct and separate from anybody else, except he's doing it several million times over to all of the various subscribers that he has. But it's a form of love bombing because he's doing it to seduce, in inverted commas, his audience to bring them under control, to provide him with fuel. He is quite smart then. Oh, there's no doubt that he's smart and he's of of intelligence as i made the point earlier on he's not as clever as he thinks he is but you you wouldn't say that he's stupid far from it Mm. and he's interesting um yeah and he he again his narcissism has guided him to take on a particular way of talking to people that resonates with them and what's quite entertaining is that you see for instance that when russell brand faces these allegations who then comes riding almost to the rescue to support him, Andrew Tate. And then, so you get these whole sort of uh, alt characters that often believe in conspiracy theories, backing one another out, uh, uh, one another up. So you have this sort of network supporting itself. So it's quite, it's quite interesting to see uh, the interactions that occur there. And when I assessed Brand, I put to one side the allegations against him, um, simply because they hadn't been proven or they weren't an admission or they weren't things that you'd actually seen yourself. Like, for instance, I included the boxing video because you can see what's happening there on the screen. So it's it's uh, contemporaneous evidence of what occurred at the time. 
there was so much evidence without those allegations and those allegations if one includes them just reinforce what's already been said about him do you think messiah complex i mean you were, you were talking about the way he talks to his viewers and everything is a messiah complex a, cl- a clinical term and is that sort of if you take narcissism to its limits you've got somebody with a messiah complex it's just a form of a way that a narcissist would behave. They would have this magical thinking that, you know, I can heal you or I've got the secrets to the universe or uh, I'm here to show you the promised land. So it's an exhibition of magical thinking. There's grandiosity to suggest that you are this kind of figure. Uh, there's a lack of accountability for the way that you're behaving because you're actually ultimately going to end up misleading people by feeding them some kind of illusion it's manipulative it shows an absence of emotional empathy so it's a form of behavior that certain narcissists will engage in cult leaders are invariably narcissists some may be psychopaths some may be narcissistic psychopaths but many of them are narcissists because in order to create the idea that you should lead a group of people and that they fo- should follow your rules, whatever they might be, and often they could be quite unusual rules as seen by society, accords with the various uh, criteria that would be associated with somebody with narcissistic personality disorder. I think a lot of people will be watching or listening who are fans of Russell Brand and they'll be mm-hmm. saying, well, hang on, if you actually listen to the stuff he says about the conspiracies and the b- big pharma, that most of it is right and he's got the research and all of those things. Uh, where do you where do you stand on that? And, and also, did you get, with this 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 video um, series you did, did you get more pushback than usual from from some of his fans? What needs to be understood is that when I analyse somebody to make a determination as to what they are, and I say that they are a narcissist, I'm not saying whether that person is good or bad. That's for you to make a determination. Take for example, I tell people the truth about narcissism and psychopathy, and I'm a narcissistic psychopath. So you could determine that I'm not a very good person by your moral standards. But that doesn't take away from the fact that I'm telling you the truth about the way that my kind behave. Similarly with Russell Brand, he can be a narcissist and tell you the truth because the truth serves his purposes. It doesn't follow that he's telling you lies. He, co- he could well be using the truth. And it's not for me to analyze what he says to his followers as to whether he's right or wrong about that. I'm looking at his behaviors as a whole to make that determination so some people make the mistake of saying oh you're wrong you're you're against him etc no i'm not i approach it in a very neutral way if they actually take the time to listen they would find that i say it could mean that he's a narcissist or it might perhaps be a demonstration of emotional empathy i explain to people how certain things can be interpreted in both in different directions as part of the impartiality that exists i don't care whether Russell Brand's a narcissist or not, he has no impact on my life. He's other than he's an interesting individual to examine, and he's topical. There were a handful of people in the comments section that naturally misunderstood and demonstrated that they were hard of understanding by explaining to me that, oh, you you, you know, he tells the truth and he's exposing all of the stuff about big pharma, etc. And it's like, yeah, good for him. That this isn't about that. This isn't about whether he's right or wrong about those things. It's about whether he's a narcissist or not. So you're always going to get some of the fanboys and fangirls who don't really grasp the topic properly and come along and make a tit of themselves in the comments section with such observations. But for the most part, what I found was that you had a solid group of people who were, I don't really, I've never been that keen on him. I'll be interested to know what the outcome is. A few supporters who weren't necessarily arguing, oh, he's not a narcissist. They were just banging the drum about, oh, it's a witch hunt because he's exposing them. And then there was quite a large group, which were basically, he's a wrong gun, and this has been coming to him for some time. I've never liked him. He's he's creepy. He's dodgy, etc. So there's a lot of people um saying oh yeah he's clearly a narcissist it's just a case of which one is he so a lot of people had formed the view of what they believed him to be interesting i i got so much shit from everybody on on both sides i got i got called a, a rape apologist um because at first i said 
you know, he's just defended himself. We haven't even heard the accusations from the women yet. So let's wait and yep. see. And look, and I said that I like Russell Brand. I find him funny. I find him really intelligent. I think he's, he's really quite a brilliant uh, actor or comedian or whatever he is. I, if he's on, I watch it and I think, brilliant, great. Mm-hmm. And people immediately went, oh, you're apologizing for what he did. And, and I'm like, hang on, we haven't even heard the accusations yet. Then once yeah. we did, I was going, well, we've got to take these pretty seriously. And then mm-hmm. I got people going, oh, right, we, don't you realize it's a smear and uh, it was a difficult um, week yes well it, uh, unfortunately as you've just experienced that there, there is this tendency amongst people that they fail to actually examine the evidence and it's something i repeatedly tell the people that are my clients and the people that listen to my videos that you need to actually go to the evidence and then make a determination yourself and you do so in a considered way whereas immediately it's rather than, oh, someone's made an accusation against Russell Brand. Oh, well, that's because they want to shut him up, isn't it? Rather than them actually looking at the efficacy of that evidence and thinking, does it stand up of itself? Is it corroborated by somebody? Uh, and, and so forth. There's just immediately, um, it's this superficiality of thought that's prevalent these days that where one ought to be a, a man or woman of reason, you're surrounded by all these strident feelings which are getting in the way when people come to make decisions about things. And it only gets worse because people's attention spans get shorter and shorter. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there is um, sufficient evidence? It is a hard one when you've got accusations. For me, there's corroboration of just what they you know that glazing over of the eyes i know anybody could say that i suppose but those kinds of things and the fact that there's these text messages afterwards of him apologizing to the woman who was shoved against the wall do do you give uh, credence to the accusations well there are a number of things to consider andrew first of all he's a narcissist so a narcissist is more likely to engage in the things that he's accused of than a non-narcissist doesn't mean that he definitely would It just means that he's more likely to because he has no emotional empathy. He acts with a sense of entitlement. He has no poor, he has poor boundary recognition, etc. So it just increases, it it creates a presumption, I would suggest, no higher than that. You then have two sets of journalists. Now, you're a journalist yourself and you will have undertaken uh, investigative work, reporting work. These individuals have done so for a number of years, and it's coming from what would be regarded as reasonably decent calibre organisations by way of the Times. You know, it's not the Sunday sport, and it's come from dispatches. Now, those individuals have gone away. They're mindful of, of, of course, libel, they, and slander. And so... They've gone away and investigated it. They found these individuals. The individuals have pre- presented evidence which has been corroborated with text messages and attendances at, at hospital and medical records, etc. So that gives it credibility. Of course, what has to be borne in mind is there is the possibility, although it might not be a very large one, that someone has been bought and has been tasked with creating this body of evidence against Russell Brand because they don't like him and they want to shut him up. And the difficulty with that is that the more pieces that you have, the harder it becomes to control it all. When you play chess and you make three moves each, there are about six million combinations thereafter. So trying to work out every single combination becomes extremely difficult. And it's naturally the case that certain individuals will bribe a police officer to plant drugs on somebody. But that's quite a simple act. One person, go and put drugs on them. But what you're looking at is, would somebody be have the capability to ensure that separate sets of journalists then decide they will all work together to find evidence from a group of lots, uh, several different people to pull it all together in the way that they have? Again, it's possible, but it's not likely. And therefore, on balance, when you look at the evidence, it has the smack of credibility about it. But it must be tested in a court of law. What I don't agree with is the trial by media that Russell Brand has experienced, whereby it's immediately the case of, right, we're going to demonetize him. Now, YouTube, of course, is a private platform, and they can decide if, well, those are our rules, you've got to abide by them if you're on our platform. But given that it's such a widely used platform, it smacks of prejudgment because 
whilst one understands that organisations don't want to be accused with, don't want to be associated with somebody that has been accused of rape, you're going down a very dangerous road, whereby the slightest accusation suddenly results in you losing the ability to earn a living, and that you're becoming so. He hasn't necessarily been socially ostracised because there's a lot of people that have rallied to his defence, but in other instances that can happen. That the mob gets hold of these accusations, and all of a sudden, people find that they're, they're pilloried on social media you even get some clowns in real life that will turn up because somebody's a pediatrician and they think they're a pedophile so they smash all of their windows and that's the danger of where the mob get hold of this information so whilst i think on the face of it the evidence has credibility it does need to be its probity needs to be tested in court which may or may not happen and what is clearly very wrong is the fact that he has been tried by media so that all of these organizations have immediately distanced themselves from him and he's been demonetized and deplatformed etc i view that as wrong yeah, it's a really complicated one. I've, I've given a lot of thought to, as a journalist, the, the words mm -hmm. trial by media. And I think it's become one of those sort of slogans that we use, oh, it's just the media, trial by media. But we do need the media um, f for accountability, particularly with elite individuals like Russell Brand. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, but Russell Brand was a, an elite, is an elite, rich, yeah. mainstream uh, comedian known for Minions and Hollywood's Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Channel 4, BBC. Yes, he had a huge YouTube channel with six or seven million followers. That's not that alternative. No. If you think about Scientology, only has 30,000 yeah. members, right? Russell Brand has seven million subscribers. That's just YouTube. Yes. He's got several other platforms. So this was like a big mainstream person who needed taken down. Jeffrey Epstein's another one. Savile, unfortunately, yeah. after he was dead. So the media played roles in all of those. Without the media, I don't think any of those would have happened. So I I think a trial by media to an extent has to happen and then it's very difficult i don't think it's clear for tv channels what they should and shouldn't do youtube on the other hand i think made a huge mistake because i think that is something where they weren't mm. employing brand so it's not like if they were gb news or the B or bbc and they had to be like well hang on we you know we can't keep employing this guy he was using their platform as any other person would be free to do and what they did was almost but not quite like taking away his freedom which is something we don't allow the media to do a trial about we that is when we mm. wait for the court of law uh, and i think YouTube overstepped the mark. Yes, I think that's right. And, and then, of course, you've got the British government writing to Rumble as well, saying, are you going to? And it's Ugh. like, hang on a second. Um, you're doing this based upon what? Allegations. Not convictions. Yeah. Allegations. Yeah. Well Caroline Dinage there, the, the Dame Caroline, Caroline Dinage of the Culture, Media and Sports Committee, I think she really showed how little she knows about this whole world that we navigate in because Rumble um, hates YouTube. They're yes. supposed to be the anti-YouTube. But she wrote in such a way as to try to convince them by saying, are you going to follow in YouTube's <laughs> lead and uh, deplatform him? It's like, well, that's definitely not going to work. She, just, she must not know what Rumble is. No, she probably won't. Some Mandarin, someone from the blob has come along and said... Uh, we need to be seen to be doing something. There's this Rumble platform as well. Uh, we, we need to ensure that he can't earn any money on there. Otherwise, we're not doing our job. And this is part of the problem, of course, that exists, that with organisations, they find themselves in this situation where accusations are made and then they have to make a decision. Do we say, which, which actually ought to be the way that it is, this, in, this individual is presumed to be innocent, until they're actually convicted by a proper analysis of the evidence. Now, if the public decides that they don't want to have anything to do with this individual because they've been accused, there's not a lot you can do about that because people are allowed to express an opinion. And if their opinion, however ill-formed it is, causes them to decide, I'm not going to watch Russell Brand any longer because he's been accused of being a sex offender and a rapist, then so be it. But where you have these organisations, it seems to my mind that there's a greater level of responsibility that they have, whereby they should not, on the basis of allegation alone, turn around and say, no, because it should be, well, these are just allegations, because where do you draw the line? You could get some complete nutcase comes along and makes yeah. allegations. Oh, they rustle up. I mean, you know, let's not forget about Smollett and his accusations that he came out with. Yeah, and, and you see what's happened there. You ought to, but this would be asking people to be actually too sensible, to wait until there is actual conviction before 
such decisions are made. And the problem is, of course, is that then sections of the media turn around and say, he's been convicted of being a sex offender, yet you supported him. Why did you not suspend him sooner? Why did you not boot him out of your organisation? So often these organisations are caught between, do we get rid of them as soon as there's a sniff of indecency and thus make it look like we're whiter than white, although we'll be criticised for possibly jumping the gun? Or do we wait on the basis that, this person's presumed innocent until proven to the contrary, but run the risk of if they are convicted, everybody turns around and say, you've been sheltering a nonce or a deviant. It's the same with the footballer, Adam Johnson. He was supported by his football club initially. And then when it turned out that he was convicted of uh, misbehaving with an underage girl, the football club was accused of, well, you were, de you were defending him, etc. So, it becomes rather difficult for these decision makers to decide which line, which side of the line they're going to go down. It is difficult, and we don't like uncertainty. We do, we don't, so we want to come down. A lot of us on one side, like oh the media, oh it's trial by media, and then then it's well, well, what if those, like you say, what if the media, what if newspapers were found later to have decided to ignore the Russell Brand allegations because they didn't want to have a media frenzy, and you know, oh we don't want to have a media circus. How might that look well, in precisely. months or years to come? Like you just you didn't hold yeah. this elite person to account terrible uh, yeah the jesse smollett for anyone who, who just d didn't catch that reference that was the american actor and singer who faked a hate crime against him i suppose for attention just uh, um and and it was found out later that he'd paid people to beat him up i think which is pretty remarkable i wanted to ask you hg tudor you've done a few things mm -hmm. with me now spent many hours in my company how how might you do you have any idea about me might i be on any of these spectrums well as you know andrew i categorize individuals in, uh, as a baseline categorization into narcissist narcissistic but not a narcissist empath and normal from our interactions i would place you most likely as a normal mm interesting which means you have both empathic and narcissistic traits uh, you have emotional empathy but it's for a small group around you hmm. which is probably pretty useful when you're a journalist yeah i think that's fair i think the thing is i feel like and i think i've said this to you before i feel like that's sort of, apart from you and, and people who might be further on the you know a narcissist or whatever i feel like everyone is to an extent what i am and a lot of people would, would like to tell themselves that they care about other people more. and so what i always say to them is okay you've got a choice i've been saying this quite a lot recently someone's going to come and cut both your legs off it'll be quite painful as well but but, you know, they could cut your legs off. Uh, but 10 people on the other side of the world who you've never met and will never see get to survive or something, you know, or have better lives. Or you get to keep your legs, but those 10 people are going to die. No one's going to know it's because of your decision, but those 10 people. And yeah. everyone I've asked privately has said, oh, I'd, I'd, keep, I'd keep my legs, thank you. You know, so... So, mm. I feel like anybody who's trying to suggest that they're an empath in, in the sense that they care. I mean, we know in newspapers, and as you mentioned, journalism as well, we know that, you know, we're told, we're taught that stories that happen, you know, the further they are away geographically, the less of notes they are to your audience. It's just as simple as that. Absolutely right. Well, that's one of the determining factors of a normal, which is you care about your children, your mum, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, unless they've given you reason not to. Mm. You care about some friends and maybe a neighbour or two and some colleagues. But beyond that, you don't really care about what's going on uh, in Burma because it's got nothing to do with you. And you'll know the right thing to say if someone to ask you, oh, do you think it's terrible, for instance, that in Bangladesh, you know, 100,000 people have been left without a home as a consequence of flooding? Oh, yes, that's awful. Yeah. I used to, I used to, but then that's it. I used to live with a, I, I talk about this a lot, but there's a woman I used to live with who was constantly, um, talking about how much she cared about like south american poverty or something we were living in london mm -hmm. uh and she never used to do the cleaning up around the house and she was just sort of you know she'd i'd be like cleaning up under her feet and it was her expensive house and all of these things and she had all these judgments of other people and yet but she was like oh but it's funny isn't it andrew likes to do the clearing up and all of those things but i care about all the south americans and it was like you know if you can't care about like someone next to you who's having a clean up around your feet then i don't believe you've got empathy that extends to South America. Well, exactly. What you're probably looking at there is someone who's narcissistic or probably a narcissist because it's easy to talk about it. You know, I care about that indigenous tribe in the Amazon, but I will do jack shit to, mm. to tidy up around me. Very typical of behaviour of somebody that's narcissistic or a narcissist. Talk about it, but not do it. Uh, because the not doing it, it takes, uh, the, the doing it rather, takes more effort. 
And if you can achieve it by just talking about it, then that's what happens. It makes it easy to do. And you see that repeatedly. Uh, I, I've seen a video, which is quite entertaining, where I think it's a march for people saying, you know, um, immigrants welcome. So this gentleman goes up to oh, them and yes. says, um, yeah, do you think, you know, immigrants work? Absolutely. Uh, would you be willing to put up a couple of uh, Ukrainians uh, in, in your house? Oh, I can't. I haven't got any room. Mm. And so many of these people who think that they're particularly empathic, when push comes to shove, some are actually narcissists that are just deluded into believing they're empathic, but a lot of individuals are. Empathic people do exist. They certainly do. But they're few and far between compared to normals. Normals are the largest group on the planet. Interesting. If I if it did turn out, out that I was a narcissist, would that be a shock to you then? Would it mean that I've, I've really expertly hidden it from you? Well, we've only spoken on – this is only the third occasion – and so I would be surprised if you were to suddenly to say that. And I probably think, actually, you're not. And you're just saying that to try and make me look stupid. <laughs> Duper's delight. Yeah, well, you don't, you don't behave like one. And it, but I guess to an extent, I mean, I'm a YouTuber. I've got these nice lights behind me. I've got lights on me. I'm trying to look all nice and good. Uh, I, I'm talking a lot. I, I'm putting myself... Yeah, and a normal person would do that. You would present yourself. You have narcissistic traits. Let's, let's not lose sight of that. And some of them might be of some strength. So, for instance, if you're going out on a date, you're not going to turn up with egg down your top and smelling of BO. You're going to have a wash well. and you're going to... You know, you can <laughs> put put on your, you know, your, you're going to slap on the old spice, aren't you, matey? And oh, yeah. uh, make, make yourself, you know, you're a good looking chap, so you look presentable, yeah, etc. Yeah. So you present a particular image to the person that you're going to see in the same way. Um, it's interesting, actually, when you talk about your, your presentation. I remember some time ago, there was an individual, he was a therapist, and he was an unaware narcissist. And he used to do a presentation on YouTube. People had sent me in his direction to say, HG, do you think this person's a, a narcissist? And the woman that he would do the presentations with was actually one of his therapist clients. So there's a no-no that he got with her. And I remember on one of them, she was presenting. And then he walks in 15 minutes late and could be heard shouting, is there anything to eat? And she says, it's in the pot. And then he comes over onto the screen eating some spaghetti bolognese when he's meant to be doing a live stream with the audience. And that was an unaware narcissist who acted without due regard for his audience, showed a sense of entitlement to turn up late and a lack of accountability. The fact that he was eating on screen when he ought to have been sat there giving people their attention. So it can work both ways. You might have a narcissist that makes it all look very stylized and so forth. Uh, and then you had another who's a complete slob because he really doesn't care. And it's like, hey, I'm here. I'm the main draw. You know, I could be sat here in my underpants eating spaghetti bolognese and you better listen to me so just because you want to present things in a in a way that makes you look good doesn't per se make you a narcissist everybody does that apart from him mm, that's interesting <laughs> I, I see people all the time youtubers who go around uh they're just like on their phone like walking to the bus and i think how do you have that confidence and and i think disregard for your audience to just be like blah 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 and then just cut the phone is there's another bit of money there's some more likes i'm happy i don't care about that i'd be ashamed i think but well um, again there, therein lies a difference that these individuals uh, you see it regularly and i commented on it I commented about it in a recent video where you get these unaware narcissists who do the old, I'm popping into the supermarket and I'm going to pay for old Granny Miggins shopping here, but I'm going to film it as well. And it's like, yeah, most likely a narcissist or an individual that has seen this happen and because of herd mentality copies it and they may well be narcissistic themselves or normal. And it's that kind of behavior whereby, you know, I'm taking a dump. I think I'd better film it and talk to my audience about it because unless an audience witnesses, it doesn't really happen. And that's the subconscious <laughs> mindset of the narcissist because they need that validation from their audience. They can't just do it for the sake of doing it. It has to be done for the prime aims, one of which is that there is an audience or a person that responds to what they're doing because it validates their existence. 
Mr. Beast, who is the biggest, well, one of the biggest, or maybe the biggest independent YouTuber in the world, he got big by sort of giving a hundred dollars to did. a homeless person and sort of repeating that and repeating that. And then he's a bit annoyed uh, that other people are copying him doing that. Yeah. Uh, and I wondered, I mean, even just to be that successful as well, you've got to have some narcissistic traits. You have. I mean, the fact is that in, in order to put part of your life out there on a platform for other people to comment upon, be it good or be it bad, you've got to have a degree of uh, showmanship about you and vanity and pride, which are narcissistic traits. I mentioned uh, the other day about how with Russell Brand, just going back to him for a moment, that whilst these allegations will be a threat to control for him, he's loving all of this attention. It's manna from heaven for him. He's lapping it up. The opportunity to talk about it, the opportunity to leverage off the back of it. And so with m many individuals, the fact is that, that because they have a platform, that panders to their narcissistic traits. There'll be some people who think, oh, I can't think of anything worse than sticking myself on YouTube. Good Lord, no, I don't want to do that at all. Um, I, I, I'll write something for somebody else to, to, to read out for me, but I've no interest and I don't even want to be credited. Um, I'm not interested in the world knowing about me. But many people that do appear on these platforms have to have some uh, narcissistic traits to drive them to want to put their life out there. And of course, many are out and out narcissists because it's a fantastic way of getting to the prime aims one of the celebrity sex scandals and there's been loads this year so i could be talking about one of any sort of six or seven or eight people in the uk uh, uh, just starting in the uk then the us as well but one of them uh was actually watching my videos talking about them and okay. messaged a mutual friend saying please can you tell andrew to stop he's been horrible about me and I did wonder that same thing that you thought. Uh, obviously, you can't speculate because you don't know which one it is. But I did wonder that same thing of like, but does he secretly like it? Uh, does he really want me to stop? It sounded almost insincere, this kind of request, you know? Yes, well, it depends upon the type of narcissist you're, you're dealing with. So certain narcissists that will operate a facade whereby they truly believe that they're a kind and decent person. If you're speaking supposedly ill of them, Although that's giving them fuel, what I call challenge fuel, it's a threat to control and their narcissism will compel them essentially through a pity play. Uh, Andrew, don't be a big meanie and do it through proxy, through another person. So they, they haven't even got the balls to confront you directly. They cowardly do it through a third party. So certain narcissists would do that and although they're being spoken about, the threat to control is more important to them, so they don't actually like it at all, and therefore uh, they want you to stop it. Other narcissists, they would make it seem like they want to stop, if only to provoke you further, so that you lash out at them, uh, what I call highly provocative narcissists. And a great example of that, the, the former footballer, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, whereby he engages in all that shithousery and he absolutely loves it. And uh, if you, if you criticise him, he's like, I really don't care. Because what he'll do is, you're giving him this negative fuel, which is what he wants. It makes him feel powerful. Yes, you're calling him names, which threatens his sense of control, but he automatically dismisses it because he basically thinks, I am Zlatan, you are the beetle beneath my boot, you are rubbish, I've scored 500 club goals and won 34 trophies or whatever, I'm a multimillionaire. And thus, he, he loves the controversy. So you'll find with certain narcissists that they will want to stir up the controversy because they thrive on it, they really do enjoy it. Some don't, and they want you to stop it because it's a threat to control. And you will find there'll be some that will make a noise of because it's for the sake of appearances. You must stop this. What you're saying about me is awful. But they're actually lapping it up at the same time. So Russell Brand falls into that category. It, on the one hand, he's, he's loving it, but he still needs to say, this is wrong and there's this smear campaign against me and there's secret forces at work, etc., because he needs to nullify that threat to control at the same time. But he's actually loving all of this fuel that's coming his way.
Zlatan Ibrahimovic is a great example, I think, of that kind of cult leader or that that narcissist. That how how narcissism is able to capture an entire audience. Because I remember seeing him on some American talk show. It might have been Colbert or uh, I don't know who it was exactly, but he was out in America and he was doing some PR and stuff. Uh, and everything he said, firstly, was just not very funny or intelligent, but it was mean, you know, or, yes. or arrogant. And the audience lapped it up and just laughing and laughing, no matter how, And all he was saying was like, I am Zlatan, I am amazing. And people yes. are like laughing their heads. Oh, this guy's brilliant. They're enthralled to him. Amazing. Yep. It is. And it's because it's sort of seen as a pantomime villain because he's successful. Mm. So he's a talented footballer. But, you know, this is the guy that would lunged in with a two-footed uh, challenge on somebody, hospitalizing them and said, I waited four years to do that because he'd done something to me earlier. So he, he deliberately set out to injure that individual. He's got a long list of... Wasn't that Roy Keane? No, no. Ibrahimovic did it to a player. Keane's behaved that way, of course, with uh, Alf Inga Holland. But oh, with, yeah. with uh, Ibrahimovic, he'd waited four years to get somebody. And, and he freely admitted to it. He's, and he <laughs> plays on this image of, I am the Zlatan, you know, I am, I am the god of football. And... Um, he enjoys the shithousery of injuring his opponents and fighting with them and being verbally abusive. And you say, as you identify, certain people lap it up because they don't actually realise what it is. And it's almost because it's so extreme, it becomes, it becomes comical because they think, oh, he's just playing a role, it's a caricature. No, that's who he is. He, he's showing you precisely what he is in plain sight and you're letting him get away with it without condemnation because you just think it's funny and it's a role that he's playing. Could be talking about Ibrahimovic, could be talking about Mr. Brand. Um, you've been an outspoken critic of Meghan Markle. I do always try to remind viewers and listeners, she's not, I don't think she's the worst person in the world. Um, and then people get upset with me in the comments and they say, yes, she is. I said, no, she's not the worst person in the world. She's just got some traits that I find really hypocritical and, and, and annoying. Why do videos, firstly, why do you think videos pointing out her hypocrisies get so many views? And why do people get their back up about Meghan Markle so much? I think it's because, unlike the characters that we've been just discussing, she holds herself out as, I, I care. I'm a philanthropist. I'm into charity. I'm into empowerment of young women. So with Ibrahimovic, we will say, yeah, he he's a dick. But at least he's, at least he's honest with it. And, he, and he's good at something. He's a bloody good footballer, or was. With her, she has no talent. She was a mediocre actress, and that's it. There's nothing more that comes with the package. And I think it's, I think it's a case that she irritates and causes such quite uh, visceral, not guttural as she would think, visceral reactions in individuals because it's her hypocrisy that stinks so much. If she said, yeah, <clears throat> I think the royal family were nasty to me, so I decided to get them, people would say, well, that's awful. But they would at least think, well, you're being honest. But with her, they dislike her dishonesty. And I think particularly in the United Kingdom, there is this prevailing attitude of the concept of fair play, that you give everybody a chance and that you, you play fair. You know, it's just not cricket, you know, if you don't do it in an appropriate way. And with her, she's seen as the interloper that has lied that, and has done so basically to an organisation that can't answer back, and that offends people's sense of fair play. So she's a talent-free zone, she's a hypocrite, and her target has been an organisation that can't really answer back. And that is deemed to be unfair and offends people's sense of fair play. You see, with all, with all of that, Although she obviously tries to make it about race, and some of her supporters do, it's got nothing to do with race. It's to do with her behaviour. And it really is a pathetic comeback to suggest, oh, you're being racist, when there's so much evidence that supports the way that she has behaved, and it's got nothing to do with her skin colour. Furthermore, people regard the way that she behaved in relation to Prince Philip and the late Queen Elizabeth as utterly reprehensible where you've got two individuals who had given such extensive service to the nation that she came along and showed a lack of respect, not only in the way that she conducted herself, but also with the lies that she told. And it's notable, of course, that many of her, uh, many of the people that dislike her 
tend to be sort of age 30 and above and it gets even more the proportion that dislike the older you get i th- i think there's you know what i think that's absolutely accurate and i i also think there's something to do with status and I, i've said this before but i i'm intrigued about what you think that you know, we all go for status in different ways. And sometimes there's a status that we can't compare ourselves to, somebody's status game. Uh, mm. So the queen, her status game was just her absolute wealth and dominance and things like that. Well, we can't compare with that. So she just appeared, as long as she didn't get political, didn't get involved in it, you know, she did her duty. I think people were just okay with it. Even if we were living, some people in abject poverty, and this woman is going in a chariot of gold, because she didn't ever say things or try to do it anyone else's status game and try and get involved in any other way, we mm. let her just do her thing. Um, and that's the same, I think, with a lot of the royal family. So all the royals, you'd like, okay, well, they're just, they might as well be like frogs they're just nothing they're they're so ethereal and different and not us that whatever i don't know i don't i'm not comparing myself to them um Mm. there's something for example scientology do with tom cruise where they have a list of their top donators um donator is it don't need i don't donors uh tom cruise is like two million dollars or something like that or a million dollars but we know that tom cruise has given like you know dozens of million maybe a hundred million dollars he's given way more than that but that would mean people wouldn't compete with tom cruise and nobody would try and actually outpay him so they keep him at that level and now he's like the third or fourth biggest donor to scientology now what megan did and harry was they started competing for victimhood and as soon as they did that they opened themselves up to about 70 or 80 million people in the uk who all went oh you know what uh, hang on, you're not going to win this one. You can win if you try and be, you know, the rich, super wealthy, cool, dominant uh, monarchy. And a few people will be pissed off, but you're going to, we don't even compare ourselves. But if you start coming for victimhood, if you're Prince Harry and you're in Eton looking out and feeling sorry for yeah. yourself, looking out at Slough and all of these places and go, gosh, these people don't know how lucky they, how, how good they have it, do they? That's what I think turns a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that's another strand to it that they went for the victimhood and as you identify people thought that's just not going to wash because what have you really got to complain about it was like when uh, harry's wife was in africa nobody asked me if i was okay and it's like what have you got to complain about you've got a life of privilege and wealth and fame or infamy depending on which way you look at it you know has your house been blown up by a tank coming through your village no are you are you drinking water that's got mud and bugs in it no you know you ate two hours ago so people's sympathies in short shrift because of that and then of course what happens is she has created in the minds of many an entrenched position namely she is a deceitful entitled liar who plays the victim over and over again And the problem that then created for her is even if she did something which was really, really good, there's millions of people waiting to go, no, I'm not accepting that because they simply do not like her. Whereas with other people, they get given a pass because they think, ah, you know, yeah, he's a bit of a rogue, but that's still a decent thing that he's done there with her. It's, she's gone beyond the pale. There, it's, she will never achieve any form of redemption, no matter how hard she tries. Never. You know what surprised what surprised me was that I, I thought, okay, these guys are a bit narcissistic, or you know, without having any real handle on what that means. But that's what I felt. You know, they're a yes. bit this, they're a bit that, hypocritical, and whatever they might be. But given the chance, because they're ambitious and she's ambitious, I thought they would grab it with both hands. So I was a bit surprised to hear Spotify come out and actually say, somebody from Spotify, that they're fucking grifters, that they Mm. did no work, offered no ideas. I mean, ideas, you need some intellect and creativity, okay, but if they worked hard enough and had good people around them, they should be able to muster something. Was that a surprise to you that they just didn't seem to do any work for the ridiculous sums of money they were being offered? No, it didn't surprise me, given that he has always had things done for him and therefore doesn't really understand the concept of graft. And she is the type of narcissist that she is. She basically wants to be paid for being who she is. That transaction is the way that it works. It's me. Give me millions of dollars. So it didn't surprise me that they behaved that way, and it certainly didn't surprise me that Spotify eventually lost patience with them and turned around and said, we've spunked several million dollars and what have you created 
a series that's so bland and boring and is basically you having a pop at, what, at all the names that people have called you in the past. So I wasn't surprised at all that that was the outcome because she's intrinsically lazy because her narcissism says to her, you're the amazing Harry's wife. You are brilliant. You've been put on this earth to tell everybody how to be authentic and organic. They should drop down on their knees and give thanks to their own personal God on a daily basis. And you should receive millions of dollars just by being you because you're amazing. And that's her mindset that I, I turned up, pay me. And people are going, you're going to have to do something. But why? It's me. And that's essentially what's driving her behaviours. And so, understandably, to many other people, you would think, do you know what? You were given opportunity beyond compare for most people. You somehow, as a consequence of being able to suck a golf ball through 40 feet of hosepipe, ensnared a prince. And then you found yourself winding up with him, getting yourself on the world stage. I mean, you hit the jackpot. You didn't just get the lotto ticket win. You got the triple rollover and then some. And you found yourself in this position where you could have a life of privilege, a life of wealth, doing good things, being loved largely by many people. And look what you did. And it was her narcissism that basically caused it to yeah. be fucked up. And then went even further that not only did she cock up completely the situation with the royal family, she then, because of course she always knows best, goes off to the land of the free and basically says, I've arrived, give me multi-million dollar contracts, and I'm a star, and you'll want to hear everything I've got to say about myself, won't you? And of course, a couple of outfits said, oh, yep, let's get in there first, let's sign them up, let's give them lots of uh, wonga, uh, we're bound to get some juicy information. And actually, they're fucking lazy, aren't they? And their disclosures, it's the same record being played again. The royal family were mean to me, the royal family were mean to me. We need more than this. But she hasn't got yeah. it. That well, that's it. And I think you know, you point out America, of course, and America was founded on this this idea of the American dream that mm -hmm. anybody can make it if they work hard enough. They've got a big thing about working hard in America. I don't think they get many. Uh, I don't think it's a great thing necessarily because they don't really get any holidays from work. It's just work, no. work, work. But and they, they work long not, hours. Yeah. So they did not. Uh, that's when I think they because for a while her popularity sort of lingered in America, and I think that was the point when they saw they hadn't actually they didn't have a work ethic. That was when America I agree. There's two. Patience with them. There's two main problems that arose in relation to the American mindset. One you've touched on, Andrew. She's lazy, and the second is they're big on the concept of family. And she attacked two families, her own and her in-laws, and people don't like that. That's what it is. Do you think they'll stay together, Harry and Meghan? No. Mm. Okay, big prediction here. We'll have to we'll get together next time and talk about the the big divorce. That'll be a huge story, won't it? If that oh, does, absolutely. If that does happen. I'll be dining out on that for years to come when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody ambulance chaser, H.G. Judah. Well, I think that's a little bit harsh, sir. I'm providing a service by providing an excellent analysis of the behaviours of a narcissist. How very dare you. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Listen, that, those are parts of – that. that is the issue that I've thought about for years. It is something at the centre of journalism. You do find yourself in a position – I said this. You know, I'm, I'm happy to admit things publicly. I, I'm torn ethically about a lot of different things. I was in the bath – enjoying a nice salt bath thing with um, bubbles and things, having a great time, finally relaxing after a whole day of work. This is going to get relevant, by the way. Um, and suddenly got a vibration on my phone, on my phone, saying Russell Brand come out and said that he was the guy at the centre of the whole... You know, I raced out the bath because it's my job now. Yes. But you do feel a bit like, oh, am I a bit compromised now? And you try and go, well, you know what, like you said, I'm going to make sure I give good analysis and work hard and do, you know, that's all you can do, isn't it? Well, that's exactly it. There are, uh, as you've seen from my uh, vast range of videos, I cover lots of different people, but there's plenty of material about Harry's wife because lots of people are interested in her. And if that's the case, I am going to continue to give to those people what they want to hear about. And also, she's prominent because she makes herself prominent, because her narcissism drives her to do so with the PR puff pieces and the various antics that she engages in. And the press know, of course, that lots of people are interested in her, so there's always some kind of uh, commentary about her, which then creates a massive amount of material, far in excess of what you'd find in relation to any other famous person or celebrity. So you've got so much to pick through and analyse and detail, and there's a ready and waiting audience who want to know about it. I would much rather mm. people scrutinise, for instance, what I've said about Vladimir Putin, 
because he's actually of greater consequence than Harry's wife. But at the end of the day, <laughs> that's what people are interested in. One's, and one wants people to understand about narcissism. You feed people what they want to know about. Yeah, you're, that's absolutely right. And it's how I feel as well. I, I would much rather some of the really subtle uh, interviews I get to do with uh, with um, psychiatrists and mm-hmm. fascinating intellects. I would love for my ego alone. I would love that just to be able to put those things out there. And I do sometimes, as you do sometimes, but sometimes it's about what, what people want. And people yeah. also, they, you know, they're very negative about the concept of gossip. And they've, they've got to understand, I think, that humans evolved through gossip. Gossip yes. was the social cohesion that glued us together in tribes. And it's a fundamental part of how our tribes work. Yes. The people who say that, oh, this is just gossip, what they really mean is this is quite lowbrow. And yeah. I'm going to read some highbrow gossip about how this particular politician stabbed this one in the back it's very rarely about you know oh this politician's got a new idea new policy about the environment that's not what you're reading you're reading it's it's the same gossip and people enjoy watching the misery of others because then they can think to themselves thank god it's not me uh it's you know it's it's why there's a huge amount of almost what you'd say is uh what you might describe as almost like abuse porn that people get that sort of warm feeling when they read about it and think, good Lord, that's terrible that that's happened, but thank God it didn't happen to me. But they love to be the voyeur to watch what has happened to other people. And it's the same in relation to the gossip. Goodness me. And you find people who have a uh, similar uh, mindset. It has that social cohesion that you've talked about. Let's all get together. You know, you see all of these forums across the internet where people, to the nth degree, debate the behaviours I analyse it, put it out there, and let people comment about it. Beyond that, I have no further interest in it. Whereas you see in other people, every single move is dissected, and then they bounce back and forwards with their theories and so forth. If they wish to do that, it's their lives. But I, like you, it's like when I did the series about Lucy Letby. That, that attracted a lot of attention, rightfully so. And I found the forensic analysis intellectually stimulating to do it and was rewarded with people's reactions to it. But at the end of the day, it comes down to we're both in the business of getting bums on seats, uh, metaphorically at least, through views. So there are occasions where you're going to provide the majority with what they want. Yeah, that's what it is about. I learned that lesson, I think, when I was... 21 working at harper collins book publisher and uh we we had all these interesting books that i was really excited about and then i was really dismayed because i was a 21 year old self-righteous you know 21 year old Mm. and uh I was dismayed to see that the book that was the most successful that year was Justin Bieber's picture book. It was just pictures of Justin Bieber. And it was actually more popular than all the other books and the whole publisher put together. And I was just all upset about it. And then my boss at the time said, look, we do those books so that we can also do the other books and not make a loss. You know, that's that's humanity. What do you want? Yeah, you've you've got to do the stuff that um, sells by the truckload so that the more niche stuff is available. Absolutely. And it'll always be the case. Comes on seat. Yeah. On seats. Um, HG Tudor has been an absolute pleasure people please do go check out HG Tudor's channel it's just just type his name into Google YouTube sorry you'll find it P- this is also going out on his channel so if you're over there please do come over to Andrew Gold as well that's just my name I'm not the singer there's a singer with my name hit the likes on our videos and we'll both be having end screens up won't we so just keep watching our channels <laughs>